Okay, hi and welcome to notes 5.1, which we're going to try to relate graphs to events. So we're going to take things that happen, these will be pretend ones, but basically anything in the real world, and we're going to try to relate them to a graph that we may see so we can kind of understand the graph, understand what parts are going on, um, and have it describe a situation. So really we're taking um, a math symbol or operation or, or a graph, and we're going to have it explain what's going on. So sometimes we do the reverse. Sometimes we make a graph of something that's going on. But in this case, we're going to have a graph. We're going to try to explain stuff. So let's get right down to it. We're going to try to keep this pretty quick. Um, this says we're going to talk about a roast in the oven here. Um, hold on one sec. I got a little issue. So we're going to juxtapose real quick. And we're back on. All right. So it says here is the graph. And we can see that we've got temperature on the outside here. Um, and we're versus time. That's the most important thing to pay attention to when you have a graph is what are our two axes here? Um, and we'll get into more that time is your um, independent variable, meaning it can't change, but the temperature is what we're looking at because it changes versus what happens with the time. We'll get into more of that in the next couple units. But for right now, time is the thing that we're paying attention to and temperature is what's changing in this graph. So considering that, it says, why doesn't the oven's initial temperature start at the origin? Well, so we have to ask ourselves, what temperature is at the origin? That should be the obvious question there. Um, if we're at the origin, we're doing a graph, what's the origin usually, right? Isn't it usually zero, zero? And so that means time would be zero. That would be the first part of it there. And then zero here would be the temperature. So if we're asking ourselves what's happening at the origin, it's at zero degrees. Is your, is your oven ever at zero degrees? No. What, what then is this point here that we're looking at where the oven actually starts? Well, that's going to be room temperature. Okay, um, it's not on. It it could be a, a preheating, but if we look at this a little closer, we'll realize that it's not a preheating because what would it be doing here? This would be the preheating stage where the oven's warming up to the temperature that you want. That's the temp that you want right there. Okay, and then the next question is why does the graph have a wavy appearance? Appearance. Why does it go down and then back up and down and back up? Um, pause there for a second. Think about it. Hopefully you come up with something, but let's let's throw in a little piece here. I'm going to add something for you. This is an electric oven. Does that help? Why does it wave up and down? Okay, so hopefully you have an idea in your head why it's waving up and down, but let's take a peek. An electric oven gets up the temperature and then it has to turn off its coils. And then it's going to cool some bit and then it's going to turn its coils back on. Because what electric oven can't do is stay at a certain temperature because the coils get hot, heat it up, and then it has to turn off. And actually, it probably passes the temperature that you want. So when it gets here, that might not even be the temperature we want. Our temperature that we're trying to use may be right in the middle. Okay, we'd have to look closer at that oven to see if it, if it cools off that quick or if it actually passes the temperature. But I would guess, I would speculate to say, because the temperature we want is somewhere in here. So maybe that's the 450 degrees you need to cook your cookies right there. And so it gets a little bit above. Maybe it goes up to 475 and it cools off a bit to like 425. But the temperature we're trying to cook at is 450. Hence the reason most professional cooks like gas because you can preserve a particular temperature a lot closer than you can with an electric oven. So that's what I want you to be able to do is really get into this graph and analyze the different parts because we're going to soon start to do this for an activity tomorrow. So let's look at another one, lemonade stand. Okay, so this one has a lemonade stand and notice our two axes on this one. We have profit for our dependent variable. That's the one that's going to change or that we're going to look at and amount sold is the independent variable. Um, again, if these terms are new to you, don't worry, we'll get into them really soon. So amount sold is what's going to kind of control what's going on. How much lemonade you sell is going to determine how much profit you get. Okay. So now we have to ask yourself then, why is this graph beginning below the actual point um, of here? Because we realize that this should be zero, zero, right? Zero profit, zero amount sold. Is that where you, really where you would start a lemonade stand? I mean, if you got a lemonade stand, right? You run in the house, you grab a table, you grab your mom's lemonade, you grab some sugar, maybe some lemons if you're making it that way, maybe you grab a lemonade mix, but everything you're grabbing from your mom's cabinet or your dad's, um, was that free? I mean, it's free to you because you're a kid, right? But really, didn't somebody have to buy that? Shouldn't there have been some expenditures there? So the reason that we're starting below, right? And that would indicate, and think about this, right? If we go down in profit, if these are positive values up here, these are negative values down here, we're going down into the negative because we actually have to spend some money 
to be able to buy the materials to do the lemonade stand. So the reason that it starts below is because you have to purchase materials. Okay, that's your startup cost, let's say. All right, so the next question then says, what is the meaning of the point where the graph crosses the horizontal axis? So what happens here? So obviously, as we move along this way across the amount sold, that means more lemonade sold. And as we sell, we're making some money, right? We're gaining money, so we're going up in money. So what point happens here? This is what we like to refer to as the break-even point. Now, why is it called the break-even point? Well, it's kind of like what it says. It's where you break even. You have sold the amount of lemonade in this case, and you've made enough money to cover everything that you spent to get started. So everything that you make past that point is profit. That's actual money that you get to keep that's a benefit to what you did, right? So that would be the break-even point. So let's take a look at one more before we move on to the next part here. It says a hot piece of aluminum foil cools to a temperature of the room. So circle the graph that matches the situation. Explain what is correct, um, what is incorrect for each of the other three graphs. So hopefully you've already had this done. We're going to go ahead and take a look. It should be B. That's what you should have come up with. But now the more important part is we need to explain why each of these are incorrect. Why is this one incorrect? Again, before we get too far along with this, we're looking at time versus temperature. So that means as we move to the right, our time is advancing and our temperature then is changing accordingly. Um, in this particular case, what's happening to the temperature as we move forward in time? It's actually staying the same. So um, it's not cooling. I don't need to write this as I go, but I did on that one. If we look at the second one here, as we move forward in time, what's happening to our temperature? It's decreasing, right? It's going down from left to right. That's how we know it's decreasing, right? So it's getting less and less and less as we go further. But look at how it's doing it. That's really steady, isn't it? It's a little too steady. Um, how do you suppose something cools? If you take it out of a, like you take out a, um, I don't know, a cup of mac and cheese out of the microwave, right? It's super hot when you first take it out. Steam's blowing off and it gets it's super hot and you can't touch it. You put it on your tongue, you burn yourself. And then you start stirring it and you mix it around a little bit. Maybe you put it in the fridge or the freezer. Maybe you put an ice cube in it. At least that's what we do here. And it cools off. But let's say we didn't do any of those things and we let it set. Well, maybe we just let it sit there. It's going to start cooling really, really fast because there's a big difference in temperature between the room temperature and the, and the macaroni and cheese, right? There's a big difference. And as that difference gets closer, it's going to start to cool slower and slower and slower. So this one actually cools too steady. It's too consistent. It wouldn't represent a temperature change like that. Looking at C then, we notice that it is also decreasing, going down from left to right. However, this one stays the same and decreases immediately, and then stays the same and then decreases immediately, and then stays the same and decreases immediately. That's not, again, not how that would cool off if we're looking at a piece of aluminum foil. It would not instantaneously from one time to another time, because that represents one version of time. Maybe it's one second. Um, you know, maybe these are intervals of one second. So there's two seconds and there's three seconds. In instantaneous time, because this is on one second, so it stays the same, and then instantaneously with no time passing, because it's a vertical line there, it changed its temperature, I don't know, we'll say five degrees. It, that was nothing actually operate instantaneously. You should never see vertical and vertical lines very often, at least when you're talking about time and temperature. And the last one seems to make the most sense because it decreases really quickly at the start. And then as it gets closer to room temperature, it starts to slow down and in, in decreasing its temperature. And eventually it's going to match room temperature. So wherever room temperature is at, that should be somewhere around here. It's going to match and just kind of maintain. So D is the correct answer there. I'll roll these down again. Stays the same temperature, constantly decreasing. The um, temperature is constant and then decreases instantly. We can even add that word. So. There's a quick review of how to kind of interpret a graph. Now that we've got that down, what I want you to do is we're going to do a, this little part here. And I'm actually going to only do a little bit with you. I'm going to do the first one with you. So in this video that you're going to have, we call this movie graphs. And I think everybody recognizes what movie this, this one is here, right? This is Monsters, Inc., the original, not the uh, university one. What we're going to do is we're going to watch it. Um, in this video, then, What's going to happen is that Mike and Sully are going to walk. They're going to walk in a door, they're going to walk across the room, and they're going to walk to a desk. Our job is to take and graph this. But our reference point for their starting point, let's say, so we'll even write that. So the reference point really means starting point. Okay. 
and we're going to map the distance versus time. Again, know your axes. So this is seconds in time, and this is distance in meters. The meters aren't too, and, and seconds aren't too important because we're not going to be that exact. We're going to just do a sketch. So our starting point's the door. So we're going to map their movements from the door as they enter into the room, and we're going to record anything that happens, and we're going to try to graph it. So basically, kind of the reverse of what we just did in those that worksheet 5.1. So looking at this, I'm going to go ahead and start the video, and we're going to map. I'm going to just do Sully with you, and then you're going to finish this off on your own, okay? So looking at Sully, if you remember, so which one's Sully? Do you remember which one's Sully here and which one's uh, Mike? This is Sully, and this is Mike here, right? Mike Grabowski, the little green guy. Um, we're going to map Sully, so his movements as we play through it once. Okay, so as we're watching this is the opening scene, there's the door, that's a reference point. So they're moving away from the door as they go. That's kind of loud, hopefully you can handle both volumes. So as they're walking, so let's go ahead and start to map some of this. So they're walking in, walking in. I know the clip bounces back and forth. I got a little commercial there. Um, let's see if we can get it to continue here. Okay, so notice that they started to walk. Again, we're mapping Sully. We stop. So let's go ahead and make him stop. So what does stopping look like? It should look like a constant line, right? So he stops, he stops, he stops. He turns around and now he proceeds to walk ahead again. So he's walking, walking, same kind of constant speed. Walking, walking, and so you can see here at the desk, we'll assume they're still walking. So if we look over here, they're still walking, still walking, still walking, and they reach the desk. So that would be a point at which they're not traveling towards the desk any farther. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and pause the video there, and you kind of have an idea of what's going on, right? So you can see here his constant walking, and then he pauses to talk to those other two monsters, and then he continues on to the desk. Notice, as time goes on, what are we doing from distance meters from the door? We're increasing, increasing, increasing. Recording a spot where we weren't moving, right? Doesn't increase at that point. So that's what we're looking to do. Um, I've done that. You already watched the clip and you got to do mic and then you're going to change that clip here. Let me blow this up a little bit. Um, I'll blow that up. Oh, we'll go down here. You're going to change that clip and do your reference point from not the door this time, the second time. You're going to do it from the desk. So ask yourself what's happening. If they're opening the door and they're walking to the desk, should we be increasing or decreasing, right? Ask yourself that. That'll first help you. Um, second, on mics, you would think it's going to be the same, but there is a difference. So see if you can go back through and watch the video and catch what the difference is. There should be a slight difference in there, two things. Even though they did walk together, watch, because there's a little something to that. All right, so you should have enough to finish this up. Um, the videos are in Edpuzzle, so you or this video is in Edpuzzle. You should, should be able to go into Edpuzzle and watch it, um, and then have this ready for tomorrow when we get back to class, because we'll talk about it. All right, we'll see you in class.